Idaho, a state known for its potatoes, potatoes, and being real cold and northern and stuff and having some beautiful places because them Rocky Mountains and such. The city that we're going to be talking about is actually just two miles outside Boise and it is called Garden City, Idaho. Now Garden City, Idaho is roughly home to 12,000 people and is clearly a suburb of Boise. Idaho is a fairly safe place but the poverty and sometimes drug abuse in this particular city doesn't make it the safest place to live according to the Census Bureau. It's it's okay. Um, statistically, it's higher than it should be. But either way, this case still rocked Garden City pretty damn hard. So today, we're just gonna jump into it and start talking about people. And the first person we're gonna talk about today is Brian Geddes. And he is the victim, unfortunately, in this particular case. But uh, here's some background on him. He was born in 1962 in Sacramento, California. He had one younger sister and eventually, I couldn't find this out. I don't know how he got to Idaho, but he did. He got to Idaho and he also had two children and five grandchildren at the time of his passing. Now, Brian Geddes was a self-made man. He actually had a $600 unemployment check in the 80s. And what he did is he took that, bought a car, fixed it up, and flipped it. And did that over and over and over again till he was a self-made man. And then at that point, what he did is he started investing in real estate. So he was definitely sitting on a small fortune at this time. And he was pretty close to his daughter, Megan, and his kids. So he seemed like a good guy, and the cops even said he seemed to be an upstanding citizen. The concern comes in when Megan, who was Brian's daughter, couldn't get a hold of him on his birthday. And several days later, she got a text from him saying that he was across the border in Nevada gambling, which was very unlike him. It was very out of character. So Megan and her brother became very suspicious, and rightfully so, and went to the cops. Now, before we go down that full rabbit hole, there's somebody that Brian met between this time period we're talking about, before his daughter reported him missing, he met this beautiful young girl when he was on the walking path near the river near his house, which he loved very much. And her name was Jordan. They were talking and it sounded like he was taken by her beauty, but it was just casual conversation, nothing more than that. They just kind of had a little bit of a spark. So it was not that long after he hears a knock at the door and he opens it and it's that girl Jordan he had met on the trail near his house. Now she was standing there pretty shaken up and bruised and hurt and she claimed that she was being beaten by her boyfriend. So Brian brought her in and also called the cops, which is, you know, the right thing to do. However, Megan, once again Brian's daughter, is very suspicious of Jordan because she's this beautiful young thing. And as I said before, Brian's pretty wealthy. So Megan's like, hey, dad, maybe uh, watch out for that because that could lead to a potentially perilous situation for you. And Brian told Megan, don't worry about it. We're just friends. Now, what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to introduce you a little bit more to Jordan. So Jordan Shaver was born in 1991. Her parents divorced very young, and her mother eventually remarried, but that did not change their financial status at all. The place they were living, which is, you know, the suburbs of Boise, had a very high crime, high crime rate, just like Garden City, because of the poverty and drugs and everything going on. So people were already in poverty, and she was one of the poor people among her peers, especially in school. Everybody described Jordan as very bubbly and outgoing and really liked to be around her. And she was always positive and happy. And when she went to school, she eventually developed a crush on a boy. And his name was Burke Gamblin. 
Unfortunately, many of her peers looked at her and labeled her as quote unquote trailer trash. Now, I think that's a terrible term and I feel bad for anybody who's ever had to deal with that, but that's how her peers described her at the time. And by the time her and Burke were in high school, apparently she had a tattoo on her chest and was viewed as angsty. So she had befriended Burke and he actually even tried to kiss him on her 10th birthday and he kind of got really mad at her and they just grew more and more distant. Now, after 2009, which is the year that both Jordan and Burke graduated. Burke said he was studying and doing some stuff to, you know, further his education and get a career going. And he went on Facebook just as a break, you know, in between studies and saw what he thought was this guy, Jordan, liking all his photos. And he was like, who the hell is this guy? So then he clicked on the profile and looked and it was actually Jordan from elementary school, that girl that tried to kiss him. And he said he was enamored with her. She was beautiful and sexy. And he actually got in them DMs and was like, hey, girl, how you doing? And here's the story she told Burke. Jordan told Burke at this time she was living at a house by the river and that she was actually a loan manager at a bank and is really high up the ranks and was really living the high life. Now, this appealed to Burke, and he instantly asked her out. And he said, I'm near the mall right now. And she said, what? Me too. So they met at the mall. And for their first date, Burke said they went and tried on Halloween costumes because it was roughly October. And they really ended up liking each other's company. And after that point, we're, you know, in that fun honeymoon phase where you spend every waking moment together. Now, for the longest time... Jordan never brought Burke over to her house. They would only go over to Burke's apartment and she would help him study. Winky wink, nudge nudge, know what I mean. Um, But she never invited him over. And once Burke pressed the issue, she goes, you know, I didn't want to tell you this, but my mom's going through chemo. So I just don't want you over there. And Burke said he was in love with her enough. He didn't want to press the issue. So he didn't. And at one point, Burke was feeling so good, he brought... Jordan over to meet his whole family and his whole family really liked the girl and that made Jordan trust Burke even more. So she finally invites Burke over to her house and he pulls up. Now it's a trailer, but it's stunning. It's on the river. It has this huge, huge big screen TV. There's a nice motorcycle. There's a Beamer. There's a boat. There's a Hummer. He's in shock. He's like, how the hell is a girl my age getting this much coin? And Burke kind of pressed it. He was like, well, like, I know you work at the bank, but how, how did you do that? And at first she said, well, you know, my dad kind of deserted me when I was a kid. So then I just, he's paying for stuff now and I'm letting him. He helped me with his down payment on this house. And Burke was like, sick, you know, seems like a sweet deal. But Jordan's story would change every once in a while. Eventually, she said, well, there's this guy and his parents are both dying in Europe. And I'm also kind of, I bought it all off him as a package deal. That's why I have all this nice furniture and all this stuff going on. And once again, you know, Burke is young and there's this awesome thing going on. So he doesn't question it. Plus, he's in love with Jordan at this point. So once Jordan got comfortable with people coming over to her house... She started partying and partying hard and lavishly. People said that, you know, that she invited over there that were in the trusted circle she had over, which started to grow and grow and grow and grow, you know, amongst the 21-year-olds. They said there was always booze. There was always pizza. There was always marijuana. There was always ecstasy. Like, it was unlimited. She had a jacuzzi. And one girl even said, we were pretty much living there. We partied so much with her. So all this stuff is still feeling really suspicious to Burke. And he just doesn't feel comfortable questioning her because she keeps kind of avoiding it and changing it. And he just doesn't feel like pushing this issue would be good for the relationship. So he said he actually at one point suspected she was a porn star. And he just didn't bring it up because he didn't want to make her uncomfortable. So he moves in with her and just lives there and suspects Jordan of something, but doesn't press the issue. Burke has been living a short while there with Jordan and he sees 
the elderly neighbors next door and he kind of feels guilty because you know they party so much and they're pretty loud so he goes over there to introduce himself and he said it was awkward to say the least and strange so they were unloading their groceries and he goes over there and says you know hi my name is burke i'm really sorry if we've been too loud or anything and he said the couple was hostile towards him and the 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 older lady was just glaring at him like you know that death stare like was just staring at him and eventually she never you know addressed what he said about the noise but she just goes where's brian and burke said well Jordan has been house sitting for him. That's what she said. And the older couple goes, yeah, she told us that too. And we're not buying that. So now Burke is kind of on high alert. So after this strange interaction Burke has with the neighbors, he confronts Jordan about it. And she has another great explanation again. She goes, you know, I told them who I was. I introduced myself. I'm pretty sure they have Alzheimer's because I told them exactly who I was and they just don't seem to remember me. I've tried to talk to them again. I definitely think they have Alzheimer's. So Burke was like, yeah, okay, that seems plausible. I'm 21. <laughs> I'm getting all this stuff. Cool. You know, so they just keep going along with it. So at one point, Jordan goes out shopping and one of her girlfriends and a couple other people are just there holding down the fort, watching TV in the daytime. And they said they see this guy coming up to the door and he just walks in and they're freaked out, right? And they go, hi, this is Jordan's house. And all the guy says is, where's my dad? So this is Brian Getty's son coming in, you know, clearly, spoiler alert, if you haven't figured out whose house it is. Yeah, Brian Getty's son is there and is like, where's my dad? And he goes in there, it, you know, and it's all of Brian's furniture, all his stuff, and he is mad as hell. Now, during this time, Jordan comes home and confronts him, and she holds on to that story. She she keeps saying, he's still partying out in Nevada, and Brian's son was pissed off. He was not having any of that. He was furious, and he goes, I don't believe you, and storms out. Now, everybody around Jordan said, it really shook her up. And when they went to console her, they thought, you know, it's because this giant dude just went through their house. But she was actually concerned about him contacting authorities. So that made a few of her friends even more suspicious. So now we're about three weeks out since Megan Bryan's daughter has last spoken to her father in Nevada. So she goes to file a missing persons report because... You know, the the stuff that she is getting communicated from her, it's not his verbiage, it's not the way he speaks, and the fact that he's partying in Nevada makes no sense at all. He didn't, it was called Jackpot City, I believe, let me check that, just Jackpot, Jackpot Nevada, which is across the border in Nevada. Apparently it's really close to Boise and people go over there, you know, if you're in some of these mountain states, we got stuff like that, like we got Black Hawk here in Colorado. We got stuff like that. But anyways, she was like, my dad would not be there. These texts coming in are super weird. I'm to call in the police. So, so after this, Megan files a police report. Then she goes over to her father's house. She has met Jordan before. Keep this in mind. She has met Jordan before, right? She goes to talk to her and knocks on the door. Jordan answers, doesn't remember her and goes, who the hell are you? Get away from my house. And then Megan goes, I'm Brian's daughter. Don't you remember me? And Megan said her face just went flush. Like she'd seen a ghost. She knew she had screwed up. So this was in 2012. So thank God everybody had GPS trackers on their phone. They trace Brian's cell phone signature to a Walmart inside Garden City. So they go over there to confront Brian since he appears to be a missing person but guess who it is when they find this cell phone it's Jordan and the police go in and swarm her and when she figures out at first she tries to act like she doesn't know what's going on and she just oh I don't she doesn't see the police right like that's bullshit she pulls and then the cops once she realized she fucked up she just goes with the cops so at this point the cops didn't technically arrest her but they are interrogating her. So when Jordan starts speaking, initially the story she tells is a variation that she had told Burke that she was house-sitting for him. 
But then the story takes a twist. And she says Brian was addicted to drugs. And she even rode one time with him to that Walmart that they just picked her up from and said she saw him do a drug deal. And then he started acting fearful for his life and said he was scared of that drug deal. Dealer, I should say. The police were not buying this bullshit, but they let her just keep telling her story. So at this point, the cops know Jordan is bullshitting them. They're not having it. So what they do is they call Burke up because Jordan loves Burke, right? And really has emotional reactions to him. So he's kind of used as a piece of bait. But hear the story out. They tell Burke what they are suspecting is going on. And Burke said at that moment he felt disgusting because he's realizing he is standing there in Brian's old jacket, not realizing this is, at this point, we're thinking a dead man's jacket. And he's standing there and he said he just felt disgusting and shocked and scared. So the investigators tell Burke, go in there and tell her to tell the truth. So Burke does exactly as he's told. He goes in there and, you know, Jordan's face just lights up. She smiles at him. She runs up and hugs him. And he sits across the table from her and he looks her dead in the eye and goes, Jordan, you need to tell the truth. And at that point, she breaks down and just starts crying and crying and crying. It was clear she had cracked. So after Jordan starts crying, the investigator comes back in the room. And Jordan goes, can I hold your hand while I'm saying this? So the investigator knows confessions are coming. Now, she was found going to the Walmart the day of Brian's disappearance. And she's buying herself makeup, bras, and underwear. All these items that brought her comfort and made her feel good in some way, right? She also bought a tarp. So here's the confession Jordan gave. She said that her and Brian were lying in bed and she had gotten a gun and she said it was jammed and she was sitting behind Brian giving him a back massage, right? So she hands it to him from the front. He looks at it and corrects whatever and goes, oh, it's fine. And then takes his arm and puts it behind him to hand it back to her. And she said when she grabbed it, apparently the safety was off and she shot him in the head on accident. And she freaked out and didn't know what to do. So she let him lie in that bed for a while, went to Walmart, got that tarp. Now, like I said before, this house that Brian had was a trailer. So she removed some of the metal siding and got access to the crawl space and put Brian's body in there and then just moved everything back. So Brian had been there the whole time. When the autopsy report was returned, it was confirmed that Brian was shot in the back of the head. And when they went to investigate the house that everybody had been living in, they found that Jordan didn't even replace the mattress. Her and Burke had been sleeping on top of the mattress that Brian was murdered in, unbeknownst to Burke, which is absolutely nauseating even those words leaving my mouth. So in December of 2013, Jordan goes on trial. Now she goes in and pleads guilty to second degree murder. She takes a plea bargain. Something to note about this is they had to make sure Brian's family consented to this. And when Megan was speaking about it, she said, I was up for it because I didn't want her to be able to walk away with just the charge of manslaughter. Now, Jordan ended up getting a life term. However, she will be eligible for parole in roughly 20 years when she will be 41 years of age. Now, in her statement to the courtroom, she took full responsibility for her actions and plead to Brian's family to plead, please forgive her. Now, Brian's son was not interviewed, but like I said, Megan was definitely, you know, if you watch the the snap thing, she was very vocal and talked throughout the whole thing. She said she doesn't forgive her, and I don't blame her at all. She goes, I don't know if I'll ever be able to forgive her, and I totally get that. So, yeah, like I said, when Jordan is 41, she'll be eligible, and Burke, poor Burke, you know, he, I feel bad for these guys because they're, you know, her friends and Burke, 
because they were all young and just having a good time. And now they feel, you know, disgusting because they were partying at this guy's house that are, their friend murdered unbeknownst to them. And just the lasting repercussions of that is terrible. I feel so bad for Brian's kids and his grandkids. And this, you know, he was living a really great life at the time. They said he was getting ready to retire. He was, you know, he was going to have early retirement and go have a great rest of his life. And Jordan ended all of that. And she's claiming she did it on accident. And obviously she and Brian are the only ones that know the truth. But the prosecution said that they thought Jordan was doing everything to impress those friends that viewed her as trailer trash when she was young. So she literally murdered to be accepted by people she had grown up with. And that in its own right is incredibly tragic and sad. Usually I really condemn these killers and I still think everything that happened was absolutely horrific, but it's complex because that's such a childlike way of thinking I can't, in my opinion, Jordan should be in prison for the rest of her life, but it's really, really sad too. Like I do have the slightest amount of empathy for her because the human need to feel accepted is so big. However, murdering someone to get that is absolutely, I mean, that's evil manifested. So like I said, this is just a really sad case. And I feel bad for everybody involved. And Megan, not Megan, I apologize. Jordan ruined so many people's lives. You know, they they robbed Brian's family of Brian. He, He was quite close with his kids and stuff. And now he's this, you know, figure that everybody loved. And he he was taken from them too early. And Jordan is stuck in prison probably for the rest of her life for what she did. And it was all just to be accepted by her peers. So it's it's a tragedy for sure. Thank you guys so much for watching my channel. I know that one was a bit darker and there was much less black and white than what there usually is. But I did find the case interesting. And don't, don't always believe people if something seems to be too good to be true, I guess, right? Like, and it was. It, it, yeah, so that's that's what I could take for this story, but I will go ahead and try and upload again. If you guys took the time out of your day to watch this video, I deeply appreciate it, and I hope to see you again soon.